Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Dr. Psych Mom Show. Today, I'm going to talk about recovering from infidelity. So this is obviously a really complex topic beyond the scope of just a 20-minute podcast, but I can give you a little bit about what I think the overarching themes are of how a couple successfully recovers from infidelity or really any betrayal. So first, you need to think about why this happened. There are a million different reasons, and they're all going to lead to different sorts of um, paths toward recovery. So, for example, if somebody is a sex addict and they're texting willy-nilly with basically anybody possible on the Internet and using porn all the time, uh, this is going to be a very different situation than somebody who is involved in a long-term uh, individual love affair with somebody that they were very uh, devoted to emotionally. So the tenor and the feel of the infidelity is going to, you know, strike the partner very differently and lead to very different paths. Uh, So, for example, I mean, if we're continuing with these two examples, somebody who is a sex addict, then and they were shown to be doing this in all aspects of life, they couldn't really engage without any individual therapy to treat this addiction. And by the way, this isn't like an uncommon thing, especially in the age of the internet. People get sucked, people who have addictive personalities get sucked into this sort of, um, you know, there's infinity apps and cam girls and back and forth sorts of engagement that people can have now that they didn't used to be able to have. So So if you are in this sort of situation, the person obviously needs individual treatment, whereas in the other situation, it's um, the person may say there's nothing, you know, wrong with me, really, that I was having this long term affair with this one individual. And in fact, it was due to the marriage being difficult. Now, that um, brings up an important point. Now, couples counseling is usually necessary for recovery from infidelity. Uh, I obviously help people with that. Other couples counselors do. It's not like you need that um, or otherwise you can never recover, but it can be very useful, particularly for anybody as psychologically minded as somebody who would be listening to this podcast. So when you're in couples counseling, you really need to first Um, deal with the hurt and pain that the betrayed partner is dealing with, but also you can't villainize the other partner and the couple should be encouraged not to do this at home either, make this kind of victim perpetrator dynamic. Yes, there is one betrayed partner, but if, if that partner kind of descends into feeling victimized by a monster, it, you know, unless the person truly is some sort of sociopath that, that was consciously, purposefully hurting you, I mean, this is a very unlikely situation. Most of the time, people cheat because of things within them, not because they are some sort of a sadist. They are feeling unhappy. They don't feel um, alive. They feel like stuck, they feel dissatisfied, they feel uh, lonely, whatever, you know, and so uh, the couple's counselor and the couple in general really need to think about this not as a victim perpetrator sort of thing. Both of them need to be on the side of recovery for this to work. So if, if you um, find out about a partner's affair and they look relieved and they're like, well, yes, things aren't working. Well, you know, listen to them. Don't try to fix a marriage with that person because this is what we usually call an exit affair. So the person was kind of trying to get up the balls to leave and now, and almost maybe even hoping that you find out and now that you did, they do not want to work on things. They really didn't want to work on things all along. It's kind of a cowardly move, you know, but that is what it is. And they then you can uh, separate in that case and in you know the person who's the betrayed partner can be on their own path to recovery But if we're looking at recovery for a couple, both have to be motivated. And usually the first stage involves a lot of the betrayer apologizing and kind of empathizing with how the betrayed partner feels. But there also, after a little while of this, has to be some shift to understanding why the the betraying partner did this. Because otherwise, there's not going to be any growth. 
in State of Affairs, which I'll link you to by Esther Perel, her book about infidelity, she talks about that it's going to be marriage 2.0. It's not going to be the same marriage anymore. And that is the case from what I see in counseling as well. So some people that do not recover well from infidelity, they, they ostensibly do because they stay together, but one partner is always treated as the villain and the other one is always the victim for the rest of their lives. This is not a good version of, of marriage 2.0. This is not going to make anybody feel better. And in fact, you know, it's better to leave the marriage than to stay in a situation where one person is considered a perpetrator and one person is the victim till the end of time. What you want to work on instead is for each person to deeply understand and empathize with why this happened. And that is not blaming anybody, but when people are um, not understood, they can't remain in a healthy relationship, nor would that be what anybody would want for them, you know, including their, you know, their own therapist, your children. I mean, you, you know, like nobody wants one person in the marriage to just be the bad guy forever that did something horrible that's completely not understandable. That does not lead to good outcomes and it doesn't lead to actual growth and closeness for the couple, you know, in the repair period. So first, again, the betray the betrayed partner has to be understood how badly they felt, but then the betraying partner also has to be understood. And their reasons, as Esther Peril discusses, can range from wanting to feel alive again. You know, the majority of people that cheat don't actually feel that dissatisfied, despite what uh, media would have you believe. They just have been um, feeling old, lost alone, uh, their life doesn't seem to have any meaning. And then when you combine this with the dopamine rush of the attention of a new person, they finally do feel alive again. They feel more like themselves, like they used to feel, like life is ahead of them instead of behind them. And this is a reason that many people cheat especially if they're not really engaging in any other sort of inner reflection to figure out how to reinvigorate their life without this. You know, so that would have to be understood. Or, of course, sometimes they are very unhappy. The marriage has been loveless, sexless. There's a lot of fighting all the time, and they just don't have the courage to up and up and leave, you know, or even to confront the problem head on. If you were not raised in an environment where people directly communicated, it can feel impossible to directly communicate dissatisfaction with a spouse. Or if you were raised in a very negative home, you feel paralyzed usually by the thought of any change or any sort of courage to really change your life, which is what it is to either confront dissatisfaction head on and work on it or to leave. So unfortunately, sometimes people use infidelity as an escape mechanism, and this isn't good, but it has to be understandable by the other partner, right, if we want to move forward at all in the relationship. Now, in terms of can the person ever talk again to the affair partner, no, they can't really if the relationship is to move forward with the primary partner. Because if you keep talking to your affair partner, that keeps on upsetting your primary partner. There is no friendship, you know, that can really happen after this. That is kind of, you know, you made your bed and now you have to sleep in it. And it's not fair to your, to the betrayed partner to have them, you know, have to worry all the time that something else is going to come up with this person. So when somebody is like ambivalent or they're choosing between you and the affair partner, that does not indicate to me the sort of commitment that, you know, is necessary to work on infidelity recovery. You know, only when somebody is done and and or is trying very hard to be done and is is act actively working in counseling on how to end it with the affair partner and has openly chosen you know, in a very black and white way, they have chosen the primary partner. There's not supposed to be any sort of compromise where they still got to remain friends with the other person or close or whatever. Only when they have fully chosen their primary partner can any sort of work on recovery begin. 
Now, what about surveillance? Because a lot of people engage in surveillance behaviors, such as checking the person's phone, checking their email, you know, tracking them on a Life360 type of device. Well, I mean, there's all different ways of thinking about this. And usually, the, in the best case scenario, the betraying partner feels so bad that they want to give the other full access, even if that makes them feel embarrassed or kind of, um, you know, diminished or upset in some way to not have their privacy. They understand that that is necessary as part of recovery. So in a best case scenario, it is offered but not usually looked at. You know, or if it is looked at, it is looked at just about one specific thing rather than constantly surveilling every bit of data because that can be very tiring and it makes the relationship into a police state, which many people would rather not be together than be in a police state. Uh, However, at least at first, for the first few months after any sort of betrayal, With the fact, the ubiquity of smartphones, the email, like everything that happens online, it is unusual for me to see that somebody does not engage in this sort of surveillance as as recovery. In fact, when I started working in this area, uh, you know, over a decade ago, there was not as much surveillance after this because there just wasn't as much stuff done on phones, you know. But now it's, you know, you got the whole thing, the whole schedule, all the text messages, the emails, this whole repository of data you know, in your partner's phone, I barely know anybody who doesn't look at that, you know, at least in part to piece together the story of what happened. Now, piecing together the story is an important part of healing. And at this point is when the betraying partner ought to be very clear about everything that they did and answer all of the questions. Now, if the questions go on uh, forever, I mean, they don't usually. They go on for like a few nights in a row and then they crop up again in a week and then they crop up again in three weeks and then, you know, then you talk about them in therapy. But by like about six months or so, there shouldn't be constant questions about piecing together the timeline of an affair unless there has been new data. You know, I mean, this is going to come up sometimes, you know, and it's very common for people to be triggered for years by movies with infidelity, books, hearing about a friend's, uh, you know, marriage, you know, ending because of infidelity or whatever. But in terms of the late nights where you're arguing and trying to piece together the affair and saying that the person um, trying to figure out where they were during this and were you dating her during that or this, that stuff should tail off if it doesn't. You know, I mean, betrayal can also lead to a PTSD reaction. So it's important for the betrayed spouse to get their own therapist and perhaps even support group because they may be having real PTSD symptoms of intrusive thoughts, inability sleeping. And this, just like combat-related PTSD, uh, is likelier if you've had a history of childhood abuse. Uh, Betrayal-related PTSD is likelier if you've had other emotional abuse or neglect or betrayal in earlier life. So if this has happened to you before and or if you saw this growing up and or you are just insecurely attached, you've always had trust issues from childhood and then this happens, then you may not just have a trauma reaction in the moment. This may actually lead to a PTSD reaction that is fairly severe and would need to be worked on before it ruins your life completely day to day. So overall, in counseling, what we're trying to do is for the partners to understand one another better and to have more empathy for each other's perspective and then to figure out how to make it so that you have an actually new marriage with different types of closeness and intimacy and authenticity, which obviously you did not have before if one partner was lying. You know, and that person frequently lies about a lot, by the way. They don't, they're not only cheating. People that can cheat and have that sort of a double life are people who likely lie in many areas and find this um, to be a coping mechanism with their own underlying insecurity and 
inability to express themselves. And they may have learned it very early on in their childhood how to lie to get out of trouble, you know, especially in families of origin that were very black and white about good and bad. Uh, they may have always be felt like they would get into trouble if they didn't do X. And if they couldn't do X, if there were lots of rules or restrictions, then they learned to lie. You know, so this is a common path toward people lying, which is why family of origin work is very important in both couples counseling for infidelity and for the individual therapy of both partners. So the betrayed spouse needs to understand why, you know, and how they're, they are impacted by this and what it brings up for them and how they could potentially recover their sense of normalcy and self-esteem because it's a real blow by the way, to find out that your partner was cheating on you, not only does it make you feel bad, it also makes you feel stupid, you know, that you didn't see it. And it can really screw up people's worldview if they think of themselves as a pretty smart, savvy person to understand that somebody was lying to you for X amount of years, perhaps, and you didn't even know. So that can really destabilize your sense of self. Then on the other side, the other person needs to think, why was I able to maintain a double life? What does this indicate about me and my relationship with the truth and my ability to kind of um, compartmentalize and to dissociate from my feelings? You know, what does this mean about my ability to have an authentic self? You know, it's really unlikely. Sometimes people think that they could be their authentic self with the affair partner, but just not in their primary relationship. That's really unlikely because usually people are lying to both people. You're not telling the affair partner a lot of stuff about you and your marriage and who you are and the bad sides of you and the part of you that's still telling your wife what she wants to hear or that still loves your wife on many levels. Um, and then you're not obviously telling your wife. And I'm using wife just because I see more guys who cheat, but there's plenty of women who cheat um, also. So you could switch the gender accordingly. But anyway, the betraying partner, the cheater, is the one who has to examine their relationship with the truth and whether they have really been able to be their authentic self ever or if they have kind of messed up views, usually dating from early life, about romantic relationships and kind of a negative spin on them. They're more likely to feel constricted. They're less likely to feel um, like relationships are good inherently. You know, they are likelier to use other people for mood regulation, which is what it really is to be in an affair. You are kind of using that person for mood regulation. They're usually not getting what they want, which is all of you because you remain married. So, you know, there's also that part too in their individual therapy is kind of understanding and unpacking more of what the affair was like in reality versus what they idealize it as. Because most people that know that somebody's cheating and remain as the other woman or man, they don't have terribly high self-esteem, you know, and they've got a lot of their own issues. And exploring the reality of this is sometimes a big wake-up call to people who were really romanticizing and idealizing their affair. Oh, we were just two souls that met and we were kindred spirits to, uh, you know, saying, wow, I guess that, you know, that woman that I met at, you know, CrossFit wasn't actually my kindred spirit, but a woman who probably always goes for married men and actually did mention that she was in therapy and mentioned that she isn't close to her family. And wow, that kind of sucks. Now that I think about it differently, maybe she was kind of hurt by this as well as my wife, you know, so a fair, you know, uh, affair partners are frequently put on a pedestal as though they're this um, combination of this, uh, you know what you have to really watch is the TV show The Affair because Noah does this with his affair partner. He thinks she's just this sex goddess, but she's just like this screwed up woman. And it's a really good show to watch to help with perspective taking. It switches perspectives from the affair partner to the guy who's cheating. It's really good. So you should watch that at least a few uh, first episodes of it. 
All right, so anyhow, that is just really a rough overview of the various moving pieces in a fair recovery and things to think about um, when, unfortunately, if you find yourself in this scenario. Now, you can request more specific Uh, podcasts on any of those individual topics that I can get into on a more granular level. So thanks so much for listening and I will talk to everybody soon. Remember to subscribe to this podcast, The Dr. Psych Mom Show, and write in with any topic suggestions. Thanks guys.